Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to just uh, identify some of the criteria that we have for identifying impact structures. Let's see, how does that work? Okay, yes. So if we look around in the solar system, and those of you who have just heard uh, Hap McSween's presidential address next door over lunch will know that uh, most of the planets, terrestrial planets and their satellites in the solar system are covered by impact craters. And so uh, the importance, I don't think, needs to be uh, specified any further. Now on Earth, however, Impact craters are more or less the only source that we have for ground truthing impact processes in the solar system. Um, it is fairly easy to recognize impact structures on planets that don't have atmospheres or satellites that don't have atmospheres. On the Earth, it's a little more difficult, but we have the additional advantage of being able to look at uh, impact structures in a uh, more three-dimensional mode, and we are able to uh, see impact structures changing in time and therefore kind of go through their stratigraphy. Uh, we know that they have been very important early in the history of our planet and of our solar system indeed as uh, the whole solar system uh, is the result more or less of accretionary processes of collisions between early planetesimals. On Earth uh, and <clears throat> also on our moon uh, the early phases of our planet and satellite have been dominated by impact events uh, up till what is called the late heavy bombardment, which may even go on until about three billion years uh, ago. So obviously there has been an importance on Earth for the origin of life and also for the early evolution of life because impact was a dominating factor at that time. Uh, <clears throat> we know there might be some relations uh, to mass extinction events, at least to one of them. Uh, and what is commonly underestimated is that impact structures actually provide a window into uh, the lower crust, in some cases, of the larger impact structures. Now, if we look at uh, a place like our moon, then of course it's dominated by impact structures and uh, they're very easily recognizable on, these, uh, on the surface of the moon. Also on planets like uh, Mercury uh, on the left, uh, Venus uh, on the bottom, and Mars on the right side, impact craters are dominating landforms. Um, the objects that cause impact craters on the planets, and mainly on the inner planets, uh, some of them are shown here, a little family picture of asteroids that have been visited by uh, spacecraft, and you can see that even the asteroids, in this case, some of them ranging in size from half a kilometer up to about 130 kilometers in diameter, they are also uh, subject of collisional processes showing impact structures and impact craters themselves. We uh, can go through the solar system and take a look uh, of uh, how many of the currently approximately 600,000 known uh, asteroids are on Earth-crossing orbits? And it's about 25,000 that are on Earth-crossing orbits. This image shows um, the larger ones, those that are larger than about a kilometer in diameter, that are on Earth-crossing orbits. The yellow ones are Earth-crossing, the orange ones are Earth-approaching orbits. So potentially, uh, this is our a pool of impactors that uh, can collide with the moon or with the earth. Now, as opposed to say uh, the moon or uh, Mercury or Mars or so, um, active geological processes on earth relatively rapidly obscure impact structures and therefore uh, disturb the cratering record and make it not so easy to recognize impact structures on earth partly because uh, there's not much left of them after relatively short geological periods of time. Uh, nevertheless, a uh, little more than 180 such impact structures have so far been recognized on our planet. Of course, these include very well-known structures such as uh, Meteor Crater, which is shown here in Arizona, about 1.2 kilometers in diameter, a very young structure, only about 50,000 years old, uh, which formed by the impact of a very small object approximately 50 to 100 kilometer sized uh, iron meteorite. What happens on Earth um, fairly quickly is shown quite nicely, at least the small craters in this picture. Uh, on the upper image we see uh, 
meteor crater, which is, as I said, 50,000 years old. And down there, we see Tenomere, which is a little less than 10 times that age. And you can also see it's already mostly covered by sand, and it's disappearing probably rapidly. This is a crater of approximately the same size. Uh, just to illustrate this point, I'm running you through a few pictures that show impact craters on Earth, recognized impact structures on Earth, just to indicate how fast the erosion actually takes care of them. This is another young crater in Namibia, two and a half kilometers in diameter, uh, approximately four million years old. And if you go there, you only see about 2% of the surface still free by sand. And if we wait maybe another few million years, it'll probably be totally covered by the Namib desert sand. Um, here's a structure that is, again, about approximately the same size as Meteor Crater in Arizona, 1.2 kilometers in diameter. This is the Zwang structure in South Africa, not very far from Pretoria. For a long time, this was not even recognized as an impact structure because there are no impact heights uh, exposed on the surface. Everything has been sedimented and eroded and covered by uh, young rocks and it took a drill core into the center of the structure through the lake that is visible here, uh, where at about 100 meters depth, uh, impact uh, produced rocks were encountered and then identified, and therefore the identification of the structure as an impact crater followed. Uh, another one that is probably, uh, we don't know exactly how old, but younger than about 60 million years, BP structure in uh, Libya about two kilometers in diameter, and you can already see that uh, erosion has taken a toll. This used to be a complex impact structure, which means uh, it doesn't have only a bowl shape. It has a central feature like a central uplift or a central peak. Uh, and um, we have lost several hundred meters at least uh, due to erosion at that time. Uh, here, on contrast, is a young impact structure, which is uh, even a little bit larger, presumed to be in Ghana, just about a million years old, which is mostly filled by a lake uh, that's about nine kilometers or so in diameter, and lake sediments have covered the uh, central uplift, so it's not visible at this point. Only through uh, seismic studies will it become visible. And uh, the interesting point here is, even though it's a young structure, uh, central uplift is not yet visible because it's obscured, so it takes some uh, erosion before we will see the central uplift. This is not the case for the uh, Arunga structure in Chad, where uh, we are looking again at a massively eroded structure of currently approximately 18 kilometers in diameter. The age is not known, but it is younger than about 300 million years. Uh, similar eroded structure is another one in Chad, the Guinifada structure. In some cases, impact structures um, stand out a little bit by uh, um, their, their features. Uh, here is the uh, deep bay structure. All the other lakes here in Canada are relatively shallow. This is a deep lake uh, which was first identified in the 1950s and later on uh, confirmed to be of impact origin. Uh, erosion has taken its toll on the Manicouagan structure in Canada which currently is outlined by this little lake here um, that circles the central uplift or what is left of the central uplift because there is a, a dam here that Hydro-Quebec uh, erected a number of years ago. The original 100 kilometer diameter structure was somewhere out here and is only visible through studies of the drainage pattern anymore. Um, another similar feature, 145 million years old approximately, is the Gosses Bluff structure in Canada. This is not the impact crater here, this is the eroded central uplift. The original structure was somewhere out here uh, at 22 kilometers in diameter and has in these 140 something million years been eroded mostly. It gets worse as we go back in age. This is the about 580 million year old Ackerman structure where geological and geophysical data indicate an original diameter of somewhere between uh, 80 and 90 kilometers, probably somewhere out there. This is uh, only uh, a lake that uh, occupies the central part of the structure these days. Teague at about 1.6 billion years is again very deeply eroded, 30 kilometers in diameter, in what is left of the currently oldest known impact structure on Earth, Fredefort. Uh, you can see here, which is about two thirds uh, of the uh, central uplift, which is deeply eroded and only one fraction of it remains. 
uh, at this point, approximately 10 kilometers of stratigraphy have been lost uh, to erosion uh, since the formation about two billion years ago. Now, what we've seen so far is two general structures of impact craters on Earth, the simple craters, which are bowl-shaped craters, and the uh, approximately larger than two or three kilometer diameter craters are complex craters that show a central uplift of rocks that would normally be at a greater stratigraphic depth. These rocks also show uh, traces of being subjected to impact uh, events and pressures, which I'll uh, come to in just a moment. Now, about, as I said, 180 so impact craters have been identified on Earth. Of those, about one-third are not exposed on the surface, but it can only be studied through drilling. Um, and um, these um, geophysical studies and drilling are really important because they help us uh, to identify uh, candidate structures for impact. And then, once they have been confirmed as of impact origin, uh, we can determine their extension and uh, depth and uh, three-dimensional structure that way. So how do we recognize and determine the impact nature of a geological structure on Earth? Uh, first of all, remote sensing images and also airborne geophysical data help to identify candidate uh, structures, which then can be verified uh, by the actual petrographic, mineralogical, and geochemical studies that are necessary to do so on Earth. Um, there is a variety of morphological features that uh, alert us that we're looking possibly at an impact structure. Uh, there are also some structural features that can be seen on remote sensing images, and of course some lithological features uh, that help us. None of those are uniquely characteristic of impact, but all, taken all together are a good indication that maybe we're looking at an impact structure. I would like to caution against using uh, satellite images and especially automatic identification of circular features. What works well, for example, on Mars, as you can see here, does not work so well on other planets. Um, on Earth, we have, uh, if we run the same software, um, not only a known impact structure, but also many other features uh, indicated here, so the software easily runs amok. So it is important not to uh, rely exclusively on remote sensing and aerial uh, data. I call it the curse of Google Earth because every other day you get uh, somebody who mails you an image who says, oh, I found an impact crater. And my answer usually is go in the field and collect the rocks. You know, this is what we have to do. Um, the reason why uh, we can actually identify impact structures on Earth is because of the interaction of the impacting body with the Earth. They come in at very high velocities, cosmic velocities, that range on Earth between approximately 11 and 72 kilometers per second. And because of the extremely high kinetic energies that are being released upon impact, um, there is a, a process that is called shock metamorphism that occurs, where in uh, seconds at most, uh, rocks are being transformed, partly irreversible, uh, into uh, especially their mineral components. Uh, into shocked uh, rocks and shocked minerals. And there is one other thing that one should remember is that the diameter of the resulting crater is somewhere on the order of 10 to 20 times larger than the diameter of the impacting body. Now, which kinds of uh, evidence or, or, or manifestations of shock metamorphism do we have? Uh, the only macroscopic evidence that we have uh, is in the form of shatter cones. Uh, a very nice example is shown here. Uh, shatter cones are a characteristic when they look like this. If you just have a few scratches on some surface, uh, again, you get sometimes pictures mailed that I found shatter cones. Um, they don't, they have to look like this, uh, then they're shatter cones. For most other uh, studies, we have to go into the actual rocks. Um, and we have here uh, an impact breccia, which is a polymic breccia, which also contains glass. There is some indication of glass up here, down here, over there, and I believe also down here. And when we go in with the microscope uh, and we look at either individual grains or especially in thin section, then it's possible to find um, shock features. Uh, all four of those images show quartz, shock quartz which is characterized 
by uh, the, the, those three are microscope images, thin section images, and you can see, for example, here these parallel striations, which actually re are revealed when looking at the whole grain, uh, which has been etched by hydrofluoric acid here and seen in a secondary electron microscopy image. They're actually planes that penetrate through the whole grain, so therefore they're also called planar deformation features. Planar deformation features, the word indicates what they are. They have to be planar. Anything curvy or bent or so are not planar deformation features. Um, they also occur in more than one set. They are parallel, they are very narrow, uh, usually less than a micrometer, uh, and they are densely spaced. So again, they are fairly characteristic. The reason why this is different from normal endogenic metamorphism is because we are looking at uh, shock metamorphism at pressure levels that are about uh, one to three orders of magnitude higher than any endogenic metamorphism can ever reach. Now, it's not done by just looking at these features. Uh, it's actually possible to study them in greater detail. And one of the uh, main ways to study planet deformation features is to use a universal stage uh, and map out their uh, distribution related to uh, the planes of these uh, features relative to the uh, c-axis of the quartz grain. And uh, there are certain characteristic orientations. This is some uh, data that haven't been uh, indexed here. Here is an indexed one. Those are two different uh, sets of data. But what you see here is that a certain crystallographic orientations stand out. Some others uh, are occasionally present as well. Um, if you have uh, a broad distribution all over the place, basically, we're not looking at uh, impact-induced planar deformation features. It is also interesting to look at the density relationship related to shock pressure and at the refractive index related to shock pressure. All this has been uh, quantified a long time ago. There's also a few other indications of uh, shock metamorphism, for example, ballon quartz or high pressure metamorphism, such as in the case of coesite. I just want to point out that this is an example of how shock quartz would not look like. This is not a shock feature, even though it shows some striations. There's a second possibility how to determine uh, an impact origin of a structure, and this is by finding um, meteoritic components and impact types, and there's a whole variety of possibilities how we can go about that. Mainly it is by looking at uh, chemical elements and their isotopic ratios that are very high in abundance in meteorites but very uncommon in terrestrial rocks as would be, for example, the platinum group elements, but also the isotopic compositions of chromium and osmium are very characteristic. Here, for example, the distinction of osmium isotopic uh, compositions between meteorites and some impact breaches shown here and typical terrestrial target rocks here, the development of the osmium isotopic ratio uh, with Earth history in marine sediments that indicate the KT boundary impact and the series of late Eocene impacts. It's also possible to use non-traditional stable isotope systems for volatilization studies on impact glasses. I'm not going to go into any more detail here. And it's also possible to look at uh, minerals that have been extracted from um, some impact ejecta or impact tides, for example, KT boundary, nickel-rich spinel, uh, using the tungsten isotopic composition to relate them to certain uh, meteorite compositions as well. And chromium isotopes are more or less the latest addition to this uh, repertoire of isotopic uh, possibilities, and uh, here we have some uh, impact structures indicated that have been formed most likely by ordinary chondrites, and then some here that have been related to carbonaceous chondrites based on the chromium isotopic uh, composition. So to finish up, impact craters are unique geological features on Earth. They allow us to study a very short-term violent process. After a few seconds, the main phase is over, um, that shape the surfaces of almost all planets and satellites in the solar system, including our Earth. The identification of impact structures on Earth requires the presence of shock features and or extraterrestrial components in rocks that are derived from uh, this uh, impact. And it requires careful mineralogical, petrographic, and geochemical work 
it is easy to confuse some of the features with terrestrial uh, features, and therefore it needs some expertise and experience. Thank you very much.